Well, welcome everyone to a third of our Hallmark Seminar series, where today we will be exploring the new history of post-war apartments. Um, my name is Alan Pert. I'm Director of the Melbourne School of Design and Chair of the Hallmark Research Initiative for Affordable Housing. And on behalf of the Hallmark team and our speakers, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which the university sits, the land of the Wurundjeri, people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging as well as acknowledging Indigenous owners who have been successfully living, designing and making architecture on these lands for over 60,000 years. Now the Hallmark Research Initiative for Affordable Housing brings together researchers from architecture, from urban planning, property, economics, public health, geography and sociology to acknowledge the complexity of our housing systems and their role in supporting or inhabiting um, sustainability, social justice and economic stability. The intention of the hallmark is to continue building a critical mass of affordable housing scholarship to shape international academic debate and respond to contemporary housing problems. Now the team leading the hallmark includes myself as chair, Dr. Kate Rayner as convener, with research lens leaders including Paul Walker of Architecture Building and Planning, Professor Rebecca Bentley from the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, and Dr. Elan Wiesel from the School of Geography at the Faculty of Science and was supported by Holly Jones as project coordinator. Importantly, the initiative builds on and extends the work of Transforming Housing, which was launched in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning back in 2013. Now in 2019, we launched a seed funding round to support new research and interdisciplinary partnerships, while at the same time supporting early career researchers. We funded five projects across a range of topics, and today we get the opportunity to hear from the research team consisting of Professor Philip Dodd, Professor Paul Walker, Catherine Townsend, and with her guest, Dr. Caroline butler Bowden, who has co-published with Dr. Charles Pickett. Now the funder's research is analyzing medium density housing precedents for contemporary Melbourne. The output of this work will combine social and historical research and design analysis. It'll assess the achievements and failures of attempts to increase density in inner and middle suburbs with the aim to influence and inform contemporary design and policy. Now we've given each speaker just over seven minutes to present and I'll introduce each speaker at the beginning of the presentation, but we'll also be running a QA and a in a panel session at the end. So please submit questions as we go. And so to kick things off, it's my great pleasure and to begin today's seminar by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Caroline butler Bowden, who is Executive Director, Public Spaces, at the New South Wales Department of Planning. She leads a team of landscape architects, planners, placemakers and policymakers and programmers to improve and create more and better connected public spaces, including parks, streets and community spaces for the people of New South Wales. Prior to this, she was a director of Sydney Living Museums where she led strategy, programming and engagement across 12 of Australia's most important heritage sites. She's an award-winning author and curator of multiple projects and books about architecture, urbanism, public life and heritage. And her PhD was on the history of apartment living in Sydney. Welcome Caroline, and the screen is yours. So, um, boom, a history of post-war apartments in Australia. The years from 1945 saw apartment living finally become part of Australia's housing mainstream. At the war's end, flats numbered less than 1% of Australia's 2 million plus private dwellings. 25 years later only, at the 1971 census, one in eight dwellings was an apartment, or a flat, of course, as they were called at the time. Of course, apartments are concentrated in the major cities, as we know, and there they had gained a strong presence by 1945. Almost 20% of Sydney dwellings were flats and 10% of Melbourne's. Surprising numbers in themselves, given the fierce criticism, of course, that apartments faced. You know, they were faced criticism such as being destroyers of the birth rate, public morality, of course, and even the Anzac spirit that was seen to pass from people um, the longer that they lived in flats. A disjuncture had already emerged between published opinion, overwhelmingly critical, and public preference, increasingly attracted by the opportunities of apartment living. I'm just trying to change the 
next slide. Are you seeing the next slide? We're still on the first slide, Carolyn. Okay. Um, that's not good. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. Can you see the second one now? Yep. Oh, terrific. Okay. Um, okay, a further disjuncture existed for in 1945, most apartments were concentrated in the wealthier suburban areas, specifically in the leafy eastern suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Potts Point and Wallara in particular, and South Yarra and Turak, and they were often featured in the newspaper social pages. I love this picture. This is 1936 in Sydney in Potts Point, and you can see Elizabeth Bay House, of course, the Georgian um, uh, sort of mini mansion in the middle there, ringed in by apartments that were all built by this period. And this was the densest place of apartment living in Australia. In these areas, flats commanded higher rents than cottages and were not likely to become the slums of the future, the predicted fate, of course, of workers' flats. Um, and that's Kingsclear, perhaps the grandest of that early period um, in Potts Point. Um, and there we see the construction um, of uh, Kingsclear. And then, of course, Denby Dale, which will be known um, to many of you. This housing um, class distinction faded during the 1950s and 60s, and the apartment demographic became distinctly more diverse, both socially and geographically. Post-war Australia faced a serious housing shortage, as many of you would know, estimated at 300,000 dwellings, but was fortunate that the war years saw the formation of housing commissions in Victoria and, South, and New South Wales, created to improve not merely the availability, but the quality of low income housing. The commissions grew from the slum clearance campaigns of the 30s and poor quality inner city housing was a target of this first major public housing program. During the 1930s, state and local governments had mostly rejected apartments as a solution to slum housing. However, the 1945 housing agreement between the state and federal governments promised federal funding for apartments as well as cottages. So for the first time, we see apartments accepted by Australian officialdom as appropriate housing for wage earners. Architect Walter Bunning was CEO of the Federal Housing Department, writing that a concentrated slum area can, re can be replaced by the same number of units in an apartment block set in spacious surroundings. Sunlight and fresh air coming in every window, every flat having a view of the gardens that surround it. So that was in 1945. Yet for the first decade of the Housing Commission's activity, cottages remain the primary output and federal funding was available only for apartment buildings of four floors or less. Taller buildings uh, required specific approval. So we see these, um, these, these walk-ups, mushrooming, um, across uh, Melbourne and Sydney in particular. Um, at this time, the New South Wales and Victorian commissions were the largest housing developers in the country. In New South Wales, building a fifth of the state's new housing, during the 50s and 60s. About a fifth of these were flats, initially concentrated in precincts of walk-ups, primarily in established suburbs. Architecturally conservative, as you can see, and generally lacking balconies, these pioneering housing commission estates nonetheless had the advantage of spacious and often scenic settings, a contrast to the narrow suburban lots enclosing mostly privately built walk-ups. Now, this is the 175 flat 13 um, building walk up precinct in Balmain, you know, obviously now an incredibly affluent area of Sydney, built during 1954 and was typical. And so were these kind of crazy launches for, for these apartment buildings. And this housing commissions have got, um, you know, a series of photos uh, that are evidence of this. Um, by this time, the Commission had constructed 2,358 uh, 2, new flats in Sydney, while in Melbourne during 1955, 600 of the flats constructed that year were the work of the Housing Commission, as in Sydney, primarily walk-ups. In starting um, 
In citing amenity and design, the Commission walk-ups were superior to most of those constructed by the private building industry, and several councils used them as standard setters for their building regulations. But by the mid-1950s, awareness was growing, of course, of public housing developments and architectural change in Europe and the USA. And in 1949, the Sydney Morning Herald reported, down in Marseille, an architect called Le Corbusier is doing a fantastic job, which, if successful, will revolutionise housing in Europe. He believes in doing away with bungalows, with two-storey buildings and all their wastage and space, pipes, roads, and goes for height, qualified by surrounding parkland as a lung. His immense city of workers' flats will, when completed, stagger even the Americans. Large public housing complexes appeared um, in Australia from around 1960. The pioneer in both in size and contemporary architecture was Wandana Flats, completed by Kings Park in Perth in 1956, to the design of apartment specialists Krantz and Sheldon. Although the New South Wales and Victorian Housing Commissions built numerous apartment towers during the 60s and 70s, their output seldom matched the design quality of best international or private practice. Instead, the Commission's most innovative program um, was the use of prefabrication in Melbourne public housing. And I'm sure that is well known to many of you. From the mid 1950s, the Victorian Commission adapted a form of munitions factory to produce precast components of concrete homes, walk-ups and maisonettes, before moving on to apartment towers, commencing with, of course, Debney's estate at Flemington, completed in 1964. Shortly after the Victorian Commission ceased building walk-ups, concentrating on an extraordinary output of large blocks. During 1967 to 68 alone, the Commission completed seven towers, comprising a total of almost 3,000 apartments. The Melbourne building program was more extensive and more standardised than Sydney's and was a target of criticism from the start. The Commission was unapologetic, citing both economic and social arguments for inner city high density housing over the isolation and a boredom of suburbia. As Robin Boyd observed, post-war public housing constituted an extraordinary official reputation, repudiation of the Australian dream, an assault on the contra on the conventional Australian housing pattern. Nonetheless, there was wide recognition that the tower flats were a distinct improvement in the housing conditions of most tenants, although the common and public areas, of course, were less successful. This became an issue during the 1970s as families, single mothers and children formed an increasing proportion of public housing tenants. While well, gentrification, of course, of the inner city saw the former slums reclaimed as desirable and expensive housing. Although this trend increased the demand for public housing, it also contributed to a decline in construction and to stigmatisation of public housing. Homelessness and associated trauma are unresolved and widely neglected results. And here's a couple from Sydney of the same sort of um, program. And of course, the, the well-known Waterloo estate. With restrictions and shortages of labour and materials, the private housing industry lagged behind in flat construction during the 50s, but not for the lack of trying or ideas. Many architects were inspired by the new public architecture of Europe and the US, including Harry Seidler, of course, who in 19... Oh, this, this is an interesting slide comparing um, these slabs for uh, public housing. And then, of course, Glenhurst, million dollar um, harbour view, multi-million dollar harbour view apartments. So that different of construction for the private market and the public market. Um, but of course, this was um, the site of um, Ithaca Gardens, one of Sydney's earliest blocks. Um, and of course, the influence uh, on Harry of Corb and so many other, um, so many other international architects. Um, the Elizabeth Bay site of Ithaca Gardens was purchased by Seidler's brother, Marcel, um, but um, 
Although, you know, SIDA was very well known at this stage, it, they struggled to secure finance for the project. And in 1954, SIDA wrote that Australian prejudice against apartment living, you can see the prejudice continues, resulted from an absence of quality design. He said, people here don't like flats, mainly because of the monstrosities that were built in the past. Australians would lose their prejudice against flats if they saw those developments in Europe. In 1958, Seidler par uh, partnered with the newly formed construction company Lendlease and began to demonstrate contemporary apartment design at Ithaca Gardens, Blues Point Tower, and of course several other projects. Um, Lendlease was the most successful of several new property companies to invest in large apartment projects, creating a new generation of privately funded projects, of course including the pretty magnificent Torbrack Highgate, Highgate, Highgate Hill in Brisbane, um, Edgewater Towers in St Kilda and Mount Eliza Apartments in Perth. Sorry, that picture's a bit ordinary. Um, and the quarter deck in Kirribilli um, by a range of different architects. Like the mini boom of the late 30s, the 60s apartment boom saw public housing innovations adapted to the private market, notably split level apartments, allowing cross ventilation and fewer access galleries. Um, Lendlease also campaigned for strata title legislation, which was clearly, surely the turning point um, for um, flat construction in the country. Made law in New South Wales in 1961 that led the way. Queensland in 65 and Victoria in 67. Strata title united the Australian dream of home ownership with apartment living. Now, up until then, 90% of flats were rented. But of course, then you start seeing um, huge numbers of people being able to buy for the first time their own home. The apartment market was diversifying and thanks to strata title and other own your own schemes, ownership was no longer the preserve of the prosperous end of the market. Um, for a decade after 1945, building activity was concentrated in the suburbs rather than the city, as we know, and we saw the kind of growth of pubs and cinemas and, and um, the rest. But socially and architecturally, inner suburban apartment precincts were one of the few, um, Australia's few connections with the wider world. And in the introduction, you were talking about um, another session of this concentrating on emigre architects. Of course, the lion's share of um, architects of apartments were um, emigres. In this stagnant urban context, apartments became a signifier of modernity, progress and cosmopolitan living. Um, thanks to the post-war baby boom and an unprecedented influx of immigrants, Australia's population absolutely surged in the 50s and 60s, from less than 9 million in 54 to 10.5 by 61. Uh, significantly, households formed at an even faster rate, in turn increasing the demand for new housing. Marriage, fragmentation of families, combined with average number of people occupying each private dwelling beginning to decline slightly but steadily from 3.54 people per dwelling in 54 to 3.47 in 66. From the 1950s, new housing was built at a faster rate than the population increased. And during the 60s, apartment dwellings were built at a faster rate than cottages in Sydney and Melbourne for the first time, enticing suburbanites with the promise, as Len Lease marketing put it, of harbourside uh, views at outer sub suburban prices. Um, as apartment towers became contentious as public housing, they became increasingly desirable in the private market, attracting as well as singles and couples, increasing numbers of parents and children, and initially seen as a rejection of suburban sprawl, they became part of the suburbs of the 1980s, especially in Sydney. And here, um, this kind of pretty um, unglamorous shot in some ways, but um, Charles and I used to spend all our Saturdays and Sundays, Sundays going around taking photos and then getting Eric to, to take much better ones. This is Harry Trigobov's first block of apartments, uh, of flats at Meriton Street, Gladesville. And within two decades, of course, Meriton uh, Apartments was Australia's largest residential builder, joining Mervac, Stockland and others in transforming suburban town centres. And although critics accused Meriton of replacing the Housing Commission's output of low-cost flats, the company profited from, the, from you know, government urban consolidation policies since the 1980s. 
While flawed in some respects, the results are arguably an improvement in some ways on some of the 1960s and 70s, when local builder developers churned out new generation of walk-ups, still compromised by being built on blocks intended for cottages. Um, so, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of pictures of these, you know the type. Um, and um, in the second edition of the Australian Ugliness, of course, Robin Lloyd took aim at the suburban six pack, as, as they're known. The total effect of this demolition of individual houses for a placement on the same site by now quite standard three storey flats is truly horrifying. What used to be yards at the back and on the sides are denuded of vegetation and paved for cars. On the floors above, the living rooms. Um, of adjacent blocks face each other across the five metre wide canyon. This was not true, of course, of all post-war walk-ups, and we're seeing a kind of return to them in a big way, at least in Sydney. The genre also attracted architects and builders who followed the Housing Commissions in expanding the potential of walk-ups. Protected by strata title, for better or worse, many post-war walk up survive, sometimes re-rendered and you know fancied up, but they're still there. And they're often the most affordable housing, of course, across Melbourne, Sydney and other capital cities. And just lastly, um, um, today, of course, as we all know, more than one in five Australian dwellings is an apartment. In Sydney, it's almost 45% of dwellings and about 35% in Melbourne. So, of course, what this, this post-war period and particularly the intro of um, Strata Title was pivotal to, um, to how we, you know, how our cities um, are shaped today. So, thank you very much. Now, our next presentation will be a joint presentation by Professor Paul Walker and Kathleen Townsend. Paul Walker is Professor of Architecture um, at the University of Melbourne and Paul was educated at the University of Auckland and completed a PhD in 1987. His teaching focuses on architectural history, theory and design and recent research has encompassed mid 20th century architecture in Australia and New Zealand, contemporary museum architecture and the work of the architect John Andrews in Canada, the United States. In Australia. Catherine Townsend was educated at the University of Melbourne and she's a PhD candidate here at the Faculty of, of Architecture, Building and Planning. Her research focuses on the global spread of modern architecture, specifically the diaspora of architects who fled Europe leading up to and in the wake of World War II. Catherine is also an investigator in the post-World War II apartments, analysing medium density presence for contemporary Melbourne as part of the Hallmark Research Initiative. And over to you, Paul. Okay, look, uh, th thanks very much, Alan, and um, uh, and thanks for leading the hallmark um, on affordable housing. So, um, Catherine and I have been working on this project um, uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, we originally were collaborating also with Dr. Uh, Professor Andy May from the um, uh, the School of Historical Studies uh, at the University of Melbourne. Our original intention for, for this research was to examine in detail uh, the six-pack flats that Caroline has just um, talked about. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so these are the modest two- and three-storey walk-up blocks of flats, which became uh, very prevalent in the renewal of Melbourne's old suburbs in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, we were interested in these insofar as they were inexpensive, um, they involved the redevelopment of existing lots, uh, they were often developed and designed by migrants, by New Australians as they were called, and they accommodated migrants as well, and accommodated also those who did not conform to um, coupledom with children. Um, all of this is in stark contrast to the detached suburban house and its inhabitants that dominates Australian architectural uh, history. Um, as uh, COVID-19 hit, uh, we had to revise our project firstly to preclude archival and on-site work. Uh, and that's when Andy had to leave our project because the research he planned to do was all dependent on archives at um, uh, the Victoria Records Office, Public Records Office. Uh, and, and then we were really obliged to use only the material we had ready access to, online archives of digitised newspapers, 
uh, newspaper articles and a few contemporaneous books that we had on our own bookshelves. Both the books and the newspapers brought us to Robin Boyd, um, because Boyd wrote hundreds of newspaper articles across his life, uh, and, and, and clearly he also wrote a lot more books than any of his contemporaries in Australia. Um, so we reviewed uh, Boyd's articles for The Age in his regular column as director of um, uh, the small home service between 1947 and 1953. And, and he continued to write as a commentator and occasional uh, um, opinion writer in other newspapers um, up to his untimely death in 1971. So this you know, is really a corpus of hundreds of articles. Uh, we found that Boyd's journalism highlighted the relationship between migrants and the speculative development of walk-ups, walk-up flats, uh, and that he underscored the importance of urban design for the success of medium density housing. So, um, so I'm going to present the first part of this and then Catherine's going to present the, the second part. I'm going to be speaking about um, Flats, bad flats, and flats are bad. You know, these kinds of ideas that, um, again, Caroline has introduced to us. And then Catherine is going to talk about the relationship between um, the uh, walk-up flat design and um, uh, migrants. Clumsy, inept, squat. Uh, such are Boyd's descriptions of the average small blocks of flats built in Sydney and Melbourne in the 1930s, 1940s, 50s and 60s. In Boyd's first book, Victorian Modern, um, published in 1947, uh, he writes that the blocks of flats which had popped up all over Melbourne's inner suburbs in the late 1930s and early 1940s included, quote, some of the most atrocious of all buildings of the period. 1953 article by Boyd in The Age describes flats in most suburban houses as ugly. Um, we have a second slide. In The Age in 1964, Boyd is reported as commenting on the crass vulgarity of some of Melbourne, some, of some Melbourne suburbs full of flats and so on. Um, he nevertheless praised the architecture of some key blocks of flats. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, so uh, on the right, um, Best Over ends Cairo in Melbourne of uh, 1935, for example, and he himself would go on to build a key high-rise block of apartments in uh, the main park flats of 1962, which you can see on the left. Boyd's criticisms about the Arctic quality of the average block of flats were never criticisms of the social consequences of flat dwelling. The view that flats were responsible for social pathologies was very common at the time Boyd was writing, again, as Caroline has alluded to. In uh, his book, Australia's Home of 1952, Boyd says, um, quote, sections of the community were bitterly opposed to the principle of flat building for its implied assault on the family circle. The minute bedrooms and the absence of gardens made the very thought of children uncomfortable, unquote. While Boyd did not concur with the prevailing view that flats encouraged immorality, he did uh, agree that flats were inappropriate dwellings for children. Amongst Boyd's criticisms of apartments, um, he was keenly aware of the structural impediments to flat building in Melbourne, namely lot size, town planning regulations, and home ownership legislation, all of which privileged the development of detached houses. Uh, despite all these, all these misgivings, um, Boyd actively promoted the construction of flats throughout the 1940s and 1950s, seeing them as a means to solve housing shortages, slum housing and suburban sprawl. Um, in 1948, he singles out um, the Ascot Estate, again by Best Overend uh, for the Housing Commission of Victoria, as singularly worthy of praise. This was not so much for the design of the units, um, the, the housing units themselves, but for their setting, a park in which hundreds of trees had been planted. Provision of open space took precedent over the um, flat typologies design. Thanks, Paul. Um, 
throughout the 1950s, Boyd repeatedly writes linking migrants' needs to the imperative to build flats. Um, in May 1951, Boyd argues in his article, A New Australian House, that more flats should be constructed to accommodate new Australians. Boyd presumes migrants prefer to live in apartments and writes, our immigration must one day influence our building habits. Boyd was correct in anticipating migrants' involvement in the development of flats and many emigre architects who had first-hand experience in European social housing experiments of the 1920s and 30s were to be involved in the apartment boom of the 1960s. In the 1960s, Boyd's criticisms of flat design become much more strident. In, in that decade, um, as Caroline has told us, Victorian legislation successively eased impediments to individuals owning a sole apartment. These changes led to a boom in which thousands and thousands of apartments were constructed. And demographic research at the time showed apartments were primarily lived in by childless couples and migrants. And these are the buildings and individuals our initial research project had envisaged reintroducing to um, architectural history discussion in Australia. Unfortunately, uh, the other structural impediments to flat building in Melbourne were not altered at this time. Thus, lot sizes and town planning regulations devised for the single house and developer desire for maximum yield conspired to produce sometimes cramped apartment blocks with limited open space and sunlight. And it is at this point that any of Boyd's support for the typology vanishes. Um, and you can perhaps read some of this article, Crass Vulgarity of Suburban Flats, while I talk to you a bit more about this. Um, Boyd describes walk-up flats in 1968 in the second edition of Australia's Home as the most dispiriting kind of dwelling that has ever been devised by man and commented on its concrete car park non-garden. And the image that we're looking at on the right here is one of Kurt Veld's photographs, which illustrated Boyd's contribution to John Button's Look Here, Considering the Australian Environment, one of the books that we showed you at the start of this presentation. Notwithstanding the more problematic examples of the walk-up type, Boyd does essentialise this typology. And not once in his writing does he distinguish between the meanest of the type and the many, many that were built that brought affordable, spacious, light field and functional modern living to public transport rich suburban locations across Melbourne. And I will reiterate here our original research in intentions when I say that given these positive qualities and the current housing situation in Victoria, a much more thorough examination of this typology is really long overdue. Ever passionate about new developments in architecture, Boyd promoted medium density alternatives to the speculative walk-ups throughout the 1950s and the 1960s. In the last years of Boyd's life, there were a, large, a number of large scale medium density housing developments, which he enthusiastically wrote about in his final publications. All were concerned with improving the relationship of dwellings with their landscape and the adequate provision of open space and promoting collective living, just as Boyd had championed in his 1948 discussion of the Housing Commission of Victoria's Ascot estate that we showed you earlier. Notably, all of these projects involved the cooperation of statutory bodies and large consolidated sites. In other words, sites and networks that most migrants could not access. The inner city schemes that Boyd advanced were, and I'm looking at the image at the top left-hand side of your screen, um, that scheme is the University of Melbourne's Cooperative Housing Development, built between 1969 and 71 by 
Earl Shore and Partners. And then down the bottom, another um, inner city medium density housing development, which is City Edge by uh, Daryl Jackson and Evan Walker. And both these developments had a range of dwelling sizes and carefully considered open space. Lloyd saved his most eff effusive praise for his co-author of Living and Partly Living, Ian Mackay. Writing of Ian Mackay's Swinger Hill, and I've got the illustrations of Swinger Hill over here. And I'm just gonna digress for a second to say, no, the reason why this medium density development of housing in Canberra that was built in the late 60s, early 70s was called Swinger Hill it has nothing to do with what you're thinking. It is because the name of the surveyor of that area's surname was Swinger and that gave the estate its name. Um, anyway, Boyd writing about Swinger Hill wrote, it is the boldest plan yet conceived in Australia to create a co coordinated medium density neighbourhood. While Boyd acknowledged that the houses themselves did not constitute a revolutionary assault on co conventional house planning, he argued that they accommodated a higher density than conventional suburbia and that their coordinated common park areas and design promise to tie the whole thing together as an individual identifiable whole, which a resident might think of broadly as home. And this was precisely the encompassing design for urban and suburban life that Boyd had been advocating for decades. And it's these larger scale medium density projects developed in tandem with statutory bodies, in particular, the types of private developers who chose to be involved in these projects that Paul and I hope to turn to our, in our research next. Thank you very much for listening to us. So we've got quite a number of questions coming in um, from our participants, but look, I think maybe just in some respects, finishing, Philip, on your own presentation, and it maybe it goes some way to maybe answer Ted, Ted Bailey's, um, which is not so much a question, it's probably um, kind of reflecting on the current condition and some of the challenges we face in contemporary Melbourne um, and the challenges of how we accommodate a growing population. Um, I think one of the things that Ted's pointing out is the cost of apartment living in an inner city Melbourne. Mm. And I think if we reflect back um, through the boom, I mean, I think it's probably important to understand that the boom years that you're referring to in these presentations is a particular set of circumstances. I mean, people are, you know, young people can get, onto the, can get into the housing market. Um, elderly people are downscaling into apartments at that point in time. So apartments are actually starting to provide important accommodation for a very mixed demographic, which is part of the problem now. Just anyone trying to get into the, into the, and also it was a rental market. It wasn't, you know, before 1960, because of the regulatory and legal framework, mm. uh, you know, you had to rent. So they, were, they, they provided a very particular piece of, kind of infrastructure um, and because of that. And I suppose one of the things Ted is saying is that, look, it's great, we can reflect back in history, we can look at all of this, but how do, we, how do we use this material and this analysis to try and inform what we do next? Um, you know, so there's a provocation to the faculty, to MSD in this respect, is can we start to look at research that's meaningful to how we shape the future of Melbourne? So I think, you, I mean, you were touching on that, Philip, I think in your presentation, but we need more analysis. Um, yeah. yeah, look, I think we need more, more analysis of what, the densities are that we would like to see and what potentially are affordable in places where land value is going to allow us to build something that's slightly denser. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's not easy. And at the same time, I think not throw out many of the qualities, suburban qualities, which are valuable to many Melbournians. So high, high density, isn't necessarily always the complete answer in terms of um, uh, uh, an economic model. But to, until we know the sort of the numbers, we, ca we can't do that. But it seems to me that we're underestimating a slow build of density as in terms of trying to develop the outer and middle ring of suburbs more carefully than the push to what we've seen in the central city of immediately very, very tall, 
buildings. They're the tallest buildings in Melbourne now are apartment buildings. Mm. Now, that, that actually links in really well with a question that I actually had for Carolyn, because one thing that I was absolutely startled to find in Paul and my research was that the Housing Commission found that it was much cheaper to build single dwelling detached houses than flats, right up until they started building, like pretty much the entire period of their flat building, it was cheaper for them to build houses than flats. And they chose to build flats for a different set of reasons. But yes. was, was, was that the case in Sydney as well, Carolyn, that it was actually cheaper for the Housing Commission to build houses than flats or, or is the market there different? Look, I'm not entirely sure. And maybe that goes back to the prefabricated, you know, the fact that you had um, uh, the, that, the factory in Melbourne. Look, I don't know exactly whether it was cheaper. I mean, I think there's a lot of myths in and around... Um, uh, the rental costs and the rest of it for flats because people always think that they're the cheaper option <laughs> people always jump to it whether it, whether it's um but what we found in the research was that often the rental prices uh, of the private um flats were, were higher than for cottages as well so i think there's a whole kind of piece of work that probably needs to be done catherine about the the costs um and you know not a cost benefit analysis of flats but what does that look like historically and what does that look like today because i think it is it is an interesting one and you know i think um yeah so to to, to answer your question in comparison with the new south wales housing commission i'm not entirely sure but i can't uh, i'm sure it was very similar <laughs> you know they're, they're quite similar um typology um so i can't imagine it being very different I think, sorry, Catherine, I think it's also worth point. I mean, Andy Fergus has made a point here about land value. I mean, I think that's, that's, yeah. that's the, it's the elephant in the room with all of this, where oh. land value is dictating the product that we end up seeing in our cities. And I think one of the big things is, look, even coming out of COVID, potentially, you know, government-owned land and the role that that's going to play in the future um, and, and, and other, other land tenure models that we might, we might look at. Um, one of the things that Philip Penders asked, um, he was wondering whether any of the speakers might comment on the current demolition of public walk-ups through the Victorian state government's public house and renewal program. Um, are these flats flawed? Could these flats instead be renovated or better serviced or maintained? Um, does anyone want to pick up on that? Did you want to pick up on that, Alan? <laughs> Your recent public house. Oh, yeah, I, I can. Look, I, I think um, you have to ask why are they demolishing them and are they going to sell off, sell them off? And part of the problem, I think, is that we don't have a... Uh, it's sort of going to sound nostalgic, but it'd be quite nice to still have a Housing Commission of Victoria in action, building, designing and building houses, or at the very least... Uh, managing to to do to provide more. Uh, I think the the issue is is whether the, the there is going to be displacement of low income resident, residents from many of these sites, which are extremely well located to public transport, retail shops, and and the city. I mean, they're they're in often they're in terrifically good areas, which are now being sort of gentrified at a rapid rate and it and it's it, and, I, and look, philip i don't think it's an easy there's not a, there's not a simple answer to this i think it no. depends on no. i mean i think the, the current public house renewal program the, the the next three sites that have been looked at is quite an interesting model i mean it's a 50 50 50 split and um, so it's, it's a lease it's a 40 year leasehold on the land which is interesting that's quite unusual in a, in a melbourne context particular australian context and it's 50% social house and 50% built to rent. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a fairly big shift that's happened in a short space of time in terms of how the Department of Health and Human Services are looking at that um, public housing provision. Yeah. Um, so that, think, might, that, and, and, well, that might lead to that. I mean, I think what's interesting about even a built to rent model is it's going to change the mentality of a developer. You know, how you, if, you, if you're building for sale, it's a completely yeah. dif different thing from building to hold on to something as a different asset class for 40 years. So we might see 
a different architectural mm. outcome from that. Yeah, I think one of the challenges of, let's say, the concrete panel walk-ups is um, technically through about issues to do with insulation. So I think one of your um, councillors has uh, suggested there are some good examples of renovated walk-ups in North Fitzroy, um, and that's absolutely absolutely right. Um, but I think some of the, those concrete flats in terms of the walk-ups, the very early ones, have had to have some serious technical issues rectified. I'm going to just move to some more of the questions here. So from Steve Jones. My question is what empirical research has been undertaken on the influence of apartment design on living standards and well-being? The Australian society has been driven to the single dwelling through perceived livability benefits. However, it is rare to see commentary on livability standards for multi-residential developments. Does anyone want to pick up on that? I mean, I can just say it's an interesting one. I don't think there's a lot of data here. Mm -hmm. I've seen in the UK um, recently a lot more research on post-occupancy evaluation of high-rise living. So there is, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of learning from, from yeah. that. I think and, um, one of our colleagues at the University of Melbourne, Andrew Martell, has done really good research on post-occupancy of student accommodation in apartments and so there is some research there but I think uh, the questioner has a very good point yeah. mm. uh, and it needs to be done. Um, and what is, is anyone able to comment on this regula regulatory change that happened in the 1950s and 60s and maybe some of the physical consequences of that in terms of some of the six packs and walk-ups you know what what happened that you can actually trace through some of the physical characteristics in terms of, you know, daylight, windows, circulation, um, the ground plane, the parking. I mean, I think that's something that's really quite nuanced in that period, the change that happened. I think one of the things that Catherine and I hope to do is to actually look at a, a particular block, and we've chosen a block in, in um, St Kilda, you know, which um, was first developed in the 1870s, 1880s. And we, what we hope to do is look at all the changes that occurred mm -hmm. um, from then through to the 1960s um, to, to look at the, you know, the densities and the kind of people who were living there uh, and, and really to see what, what the physical changes were. But, um, um, you know, we were <laughs> prevented from doing that through um, the circumstances. But um, I, I guess if um, things uh, become easier in Melbourne um, before the end of the year, that's what we intend to do, is to, is to actually try to empirically trace exactly what happened with one, you know, one large urban block um, over a period of, you know, basically 80 years to see what changes occurred. But um, certainly the, um, uh, the literature would suggest from the period that um, the, the um, changes to strata title um, regulations in Melbourne led to um, um, a boom in, in um, six pack flats, which were inexpensive. Um, uh, they didn't have a lot of technical challenges in terms of building and so on. And um, um, right. so, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, they, they certainly were uh, cost effective. Um, so that's why they're, that's why that's an interesting model to us. Yeah. And it was yeah. all about maximum yield and, um, and uh, also probably different open space requirements, lead, you know, in terms of regulation. What I would say is, is that the, the universal big building regulations and town planning regulations that were adopted all across um, Melbourne in the post-war period, or the later section of the post-war period, pretty much prohibited uh, flat building. But yeah. there was a mechanism why, whereby individual municipalities could override those UBRs with their own uh, legislation, with their own uh, bylaws. And so what you get is some councils decide that they're happy to have um, any kind of, they're happy to have flats. Um, for example, Richmond has basically lets developers do whatever you want, whatever, whatever they wanted. And so you get the, the most cramped conditions built in, in uh, the municipality of Richmond. 
uh, former city of um, St Kilda was very keen on flat building and, and let, the, let, let them be developed, um, but it had s some more requirements of uh, fresh air and circular yeah. space and all, all of that. And again, so yeah. it's very much a, like a municipality by municipality. Yeah. I think that's right, Catherine, and I think the other thing is that it was some small-time kind of owner-builder entrepreneurs who could, you know, build pretty fast and can, you know, because they were based on, you know, so the, the regulation matched with the um, opportunities of the construction industry, so people could, and then, of course, with Strata Title, it was just this incredible boom, you know, needed um uh, apartments or houses, dwellings fast. So it, it was, you know, what created, um, you know, this incredible number. And, and you'll note that they, they move from being called flats or apartments to home units. And it, it's yeah. a really important transition because it was trying to get away from the stigma of flat or apartment living, or they're called flats, let's be honest. We use the British term um, for, for decades. Um, but then this home unit, it, it shifts, the marketing shifts, because, of course, you could finally, you know, buy your own piece of real estate, real estate, which, of course, is the Australian dream. There are quite a few questions about the Australian dream, and the Australian dream is fundamentally about ownership, you know. I mean, yes, it is about um, detached dwellings and gardens and the rest of it, but it is also about ownership. And that's why we're often in crisis now about our children and their children never being able to afford um, property. So I think it was a confluence of, of different factors that contributed to that, um, you know, pretty um, extraordinary boom of, of flat living. And yeah, as I say, I think that the marketing is, you can do an exercise just looking at the marketing alone in the 60s and 70s, which was so focused on, you know, mums and dads and all those people in the in-between parts of their lives when they're, you know, newly married, those when the kids had moved out of home, you know, it was particular sections of the market um, that were marketed to. Can I just quickly ask, so were, were they called home units in Sydney? Because here we, were, they're always yeah. called own, own Your Own. Mm. Oh, right, yeah, it's Home Units in Sydney. Yeah, OYO, yeah. Yep. Oh, that's yeah. of course. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, yeah, always Home Units. Okay. You know, even if they were in walk-ups or, or high-rise or whatever, you can own your own home unit. And that, that word of home mm. made a big difference <laughs> to get away from... from uh, the stigma, stigma, which was still really significant at that time, and it's gone on at, at some level, I think, to this day. Even. I mean, you know, not part of the Australian self-image, is it necessarily to live in an apartment? I mean, just to pick up on that whole stigmatisation, which I think everyone's touched on in the presentations, and particularly through Boyd's writing, there's mm. quite a number of con questions coming into the um, the Q and A about the lessons we can learn. And Philip, maybe, I mean, you've touched on some of them, I think, in some of those exemplars that you were talking about, but you know, what can we learn from? I mean, we, we all know the challenges that are out there in terms of the quality and space standards. I mean, Ted's talking about, you know, some of the compromising ceiling heights and room sizes and soundproof and durability. Um, and I, I think a few people have commented that the flats have been seen built over the last five to 10 years you know, not fit for purpose, you know, into the future. Uh, so, as I mean, is there some highlights that you can pick out in the, in the six packs and walk-ups? Uh, look, I, I think uh, some of the highlights, uh, you'll see this, particularly in that block of Troon, I, I think in um, Orang Road, uh, where you have really beautiful gardens um, and uh, I think a sense of... Uh, individuality and shared public space, semi-public, semi-private. I mean, all of those things. The, the, the issue is that um, I think you need to look carefully at um, how do you balance yield in a rental for rent and affordability with all the benefits of external amenity and giving everyone... I, I, I think one of the big things is your own, at some point, private outdoor space. Mm -hmm. You know, in COVID, we're all desperate for it, mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly in Melbourne. 
And also mm -hmm. too, I think the big question in terms of lessons is that some of the better examples are able to deal with the car. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think all the examples that I showed, uh, I think excavation in Melbourne was very, very expensive. So the, most of the parking is all above ground or only half a level below. And so I think once you decide what you do with the cars, um, that shifts what you can do at ground level in terms of the design. I mean, it's a very simple issue, but it's whether, whether we, and this is why the Nightingale program is so interesting because cars just don't form any part of them. Um, and they're potentially very fortunate. So I think making decisions about cars and then public, uh, semi-public amenity at ground level and garden, because I think that's one of the key things. In terms of climate, we desperately need uh, to retain uh, some sort of canopy, whether it's low, high, but some sort of canopy um, externally yeah. in these low and medium that's interesting. I mean, Catherine and I have been talking about we are looking at places like Tel Aviv, um, where you see the Pilatus used in a completely different way. Yeah. And the parking's, you know, they've res resolved it. So it's amazing. Yeah. It's a very similar typology of six-pack and walk-up, but mm. a completely different streetscape. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I want to just, Andy Fergus has asked a question about regulation. Does anyone have a sense of when mechanical ventilation was permitted? Um, this transformed mm. the plan. Yeah. Uh, remove natural ventilation to kitchens and bathrooms, resulting in an increase in plan depth, whereas earlier blocks tended not to have rooms deeper than two, um, two times yeah. the height from a window. Yeah, and I, look, I, I completely agree. You know, the implications of the question are spot on because one of the wonderful things about the six packs, however dense they are, you have light, air and ventilation wherever you are, you know, in every room. You know, it's fantastic. Um, and so, so the move to mechanical ventilation has, I think, probably increased yield, but, but is energy wasted, wasteful in many respects. Um, I don't know how you would measure that, Alan, um, in terms of just when, when, when it all came in. I don't know, in terms of regulation, I'm... All I can say, I can, the only thing I can add to that, that certainly by the early 1990s, that yeah. was committed. I'm not sure whether it actually came in in the 1980s, but certainly I remember detailing that, that kind of yeah. um, apartment in the early 1990s. Yeah, yeah. Completely internalised bathrooms. It's sort of eight, yeah. 80s or early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we've got a question here for... Um, well, just to, sorry, just to pick up on that, Andy said, 1990s borrowed light also allowed to encourage adaptive use. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, Andy, Andy had a question too about Earl Shore and Partners, that fabulous um, project which Catherine and Paul showed. Um, it appears in Living and Partly Living, but also it, is a, um, it appears in Architect magazine um, uh, just shortly after it was constructed. It was going to be part of a much larger development um, so they only built part of it, uh, and the university, I think, was looking to be a better urban citizen and provide subsidised housing for its staff and students and an alternative model to the Housing Commission estate across, directly across the road in, in Ligon Street. And, and it was on, on land that the Housing Commission had actually uh, bought for some slum reclamation? I'm not sure. No, no, I, it, it was. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we'd like to do further on our research is to look at that because it was a transitional moment where the Housing Commissioner had consolidated some sites where they had, um, uh, I suppose, cons implicit is the idea that they can sort of somehow conceded that they weren't able to produce quality environments. So they looked for private partners um, to develop some of these sites. and. Uh, Carlton and North Melbourne that they had consolidated, presumably in, in the earlier slum clearance um, uh, program. Actually, I thought it was quite interesting, just a couple of you touched on City Edge, because through some of our research on merchant builders, it turns out it was actually tracked at 
track, as mentioned, Elders, the four track really focused on landscaping kind of in the mid 70s. That was one of the first track projects is mm. development arm to, to merchant builders. Yeah. Um, now, I've got a, a question here from um, David Prentice. I may have misunderstood that there seems to be a tension between pre-World War II apartments being for high middle income, so Elizabeth Bay and the Art Deco apartments and then the middle suburbs, and then flats being seen as a second class housing post-World post -war, post War II. Some of the exemplars seem closer to pre-World War II than, than, for example, the larger walk-ups and six-packs and elevator blocks. Anyone got a comment to make on that? Carolyn, did you I, want to? I, well, I, I think, yeah, maybe that, um, I mean, that's not entirely true. You know, no. you had the same equivalent of walk-ups, um, huge numbers in the interwar period. Um, yeah. They were 90% they were rented. Um, but they, so you do have that difference to the early 60s, 70s, but it was this, it was the same um, thing, you know, they were affordable, they were along every um, transport route, you know, close to hubs, you know, you only need to go to Bondi or somewhere, there's streets and streets and streets oh. of identical <laughs> walk-ups, very little between them, you know, obviously, um, no no cars and it was actually that was where a lot of the negativity stemmed from because they just saw um these flat box um uh, being built in record speed you know particularly between 1935 and 39 you know huge numbers of them um and of course uh, the deco ones have become kind of quite um desirable <laughs> depending on the suburb um where they're built um but they were still seen as um, sort of. They were still seen as a, a place where you lived in those in-between um, times in your lives, or for kind of floating populations of the big cities. You know, not a real home, and that's where a lot of that negativity came from. It was there was a hostility towards them in terms of them um, not encouraging family life. <laughs> you know, so you, you had that from churchmen, you had that from aldermen, you had that. You know, Charles Bean, you know, the Australian, you know, First World War historian, uh, he was the one that said the Anzac stamp would pass from amongst us if we let people go on living in flats because they had no access to open space, which Philip um, noted. You know, I mean, that these were, they were really, um, it, it was vitriol <laughs> is the only way. So there was this incredible negativity. But people were racing to live in them and own them. So, you know, these small time developers kept building them because there was a ready market. And, yeah. you know, that comes back to land value. You could make more money from them building a, um, building a walk up to building a cottage. So, you know, um, at least in Sydney, that was, it's always been about land value. <laughs> As we know, you could make a profit, um, uh, a far greater profit. So I think um, that certainly it was the, the, the same issue with the, you know, the 60s, 70s walk-ups, but um, it, it was just a different type. I mean, walk-ups, but they, you know, obviously they looked different. But as I say, depending on the suburb, they're sought after places to buy and live in. Carol, can I ask you a question about Sydney today? Mm. Um, is there a perception in Sydney's um, apartment living that apartments are not for families still? Oh, look, I, I, think, I think that's really shifted. And I think that's because of the affordability issue. I mean, you know, if I look at my own um, staff that I work with, I would say you know, 75% of them with children are living in flats. Because unless you want to move miles out, that, that, is that is your only option. Of course, COVID will change all of that because of course we've proved that everybody can work from home. So I've yeah. already started seeing people moving to the mountain central coast elsewhere. So look, I think that, that there's still that stigma. And I laugh, Philip, because when I moved from Adelaide to Sydney and we had our first child, we moved into a flat and my parents were horrified. And, you know, I had this kind of, and I was so overwhelmed, you know, it was like, I'm living in Sydney, I'm going to live in a flat. And we were li living on kind of the third floor and that fear of balconies, which I think is a legitimate fear with children. But mm. I think then the, the, the 
I think where the emphasis has shifted is that the communal areas by and large are improving in, in a lot of these apartment yeah. developments. Yeah. So, and of course, that's, that's what's needed. It's fine to have open space all around you, but, um, you know, semi-private communal space is, is really important. And I think COVID, as you said, um, several of the speakers have said, has just underscored access to that, whether it's balconies um, to local open space that you can get to fast. And there's lots of research coming out of Melbourne that given I'm now running public spaces in New South Wales, I'm, I'm really um, reading up heavily because I think that thing of access within walking distance, you know, 800 metres is a 10 minute walk, it is really important. And that starts at your front door. <laughs> you know that access is really important so i think to answer your question i think it has shifted and i, I think it's had to shift uh, and we are seeing some improvements but of course it's not at all scales of the apartment industry and, and that's always the challenge yeah, yeah. Now, look i'm very conscious of time and um, i just maybe want to squeeze one last question in. i mean one of the things i think is interesting you know a couple of weeks ago glen ira council put forward I am a block of cut poppers walk-ups for heritage consideration. Um, and we saw a couple of years ago, City of Melbourne putting a heritage listing on some of the high rise of, of popper. What, um, what do we feel? Um, you know, there's a big shift now looking at, at modernist architecture, um, both in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, and do you think there's going to be a lot more of these apartments um, getting scrutiny in terms of heritage? Yes, a lot, yeah. and uh, uh, I, I think um, more and more uh, good examples of apartments from the 50s and 60s will be recognised for heritage significance, and they may be from architects who we don't normally associate with so-called good architecture, but I think there are, there's a lot of unrecognised um, great apartments um, that, that still need to be spoken about and, and mm. protected. Uh, I, I, there was one um, project I was contacted by a Sydney um, planner to uh, talk about a possible change to it, this apartment. And it's a 1970s apartment by an emigre designer. And I, and I said, no, no, you know, don't change it. And I think there'll be more of that because I think there's a home buying public that appreciates post-war design from the 50s, 60s and increasingly mm. the 70s. And many of them are really okay. Yeah. But it does throw up, a, I mean, it, there's a big question around retrofit as well. And we're Correct. starting to see, mm. I mean, we're probably going through 15, 20 years of perceived failure in a lot of the public housing towers and demolition of them. And we're starting to see in other areas, particularly France, uh, there's a lot of really incredible examples of, of retrofitting going on now with a lot of public housing towers. So I think we're coming in for some really interesting discussions around that. Um, yeah. Well, look, um, I'm just conscious we will just run over half past five. So look, I just, um, I just want to say a big huge thank you for all the participants. We've been incredible. Um, over 400 registrations today. Um, and very active Q&A, um, but just a huge thank you to all the panellists, to Philip, to Caroline, to Kathleen and Paul, um, and thanks to Holly and Kate for all the support in the background.